I'd like to talk a little bit about my experience teaching Vietnamese refugees. Um, that when I was uh, a student in Monterey in, my, in the graduate school, I was going to, um, one of the projects was to, the, to look at a, a test that was used in the United States and how it was applied and look at the, the subjects that were um, taking the test. And I looked at the a variety of tests that were offered and I, and I saw this one called the, called the BEST test and it was primarily used for refugees. And as I was reading about this test, I saw the primary focus of this test was used with Vietnamese refugees, which there were quite a few in the Monterey Bay Peninsula area. Um, it immediately caught my interest because uh, I think young men of my generation or maybe perhaps just my friends that we were, I would say, fascinated with the Vietnam War, partly because a lot of us had uncles or friends or older friends who were in the war and they, they passed on really incredible stories about their experience in the Vietnam War and also from the movies that were popular at the time, um, Deer Hunter, Apocalypse Now. The, the images of war were fascinating because we didn't really know the details. We just knew about the glamour and, and the intrigue of the war. So um, I started to do research on this project. At the same time, I was working um, tutoring ESL. And I was introduced to a young Vietnamese woman, maybe not so young, but probably in her 30s, who was um, interested in learning English in a private one-on-one -on -one session. Her boyfriend at the time um, was a gentleman, I believe his name was Mr. Lowry, but he was an ABC correspondent who was going to be sent to Moscow, and um, that he was training in Russian, and um, his girlfriend wanted to learn some English while they were at the school. That. Uh, this young woman, her name is Xuan Sheng Ve, that she told me her story about being in Vietnam, meeting this, this young reporter at the fall of uh, Saigon in 1975, and how this reporter and her decided to not leave with the final plane, but to stay in Vietnam because he wanted to cover the aftermath of, of the U.S. pulling out of Saigon. And so they had adventures there, and so during our ESL lessons, basically I was the listener and I was supposed to um, give comments on her English, but in, in effect I was just so captivated by her story of Vietnam and also the collapse of Vietnam and, and also her, her escapades in escaping. She would talk about um, escaping in the middle of the night, selling all their valuables and buying gold and hiding gold and sewing gold pieces in, in the fabrics of their clothes so that um, if pirates would come upon their boat as they were fleeing the country, they, they wouldn't have to give up their valuables. And I, I remember just stopping her and say, pirates? What do you mean pirates? And then she explained that during that time there were uh, men who, who, who were in that area who were preying upon these women and children who were free, fleeing Vietnam, um, they would uh, kill the men, they would rob them all the valuables, they'd rape the women, and sometimes put them on small little islets in the South China Seas and leave them there with a little bit of food, and after a couple of weeks they'd come back and rape them again. And so she came back, she said, to LA with a bunch of women who were uh, devastated by their experience psychologically, and at that time, you know, there was no psychological help for these women. Um, and so as she was saying this, I was, I, I, it, I would, it really affected me so deeply beyond um, the romanticism of Hollywood films, beyond the drug-fueled stories of my friends and uncles. And so uh, several years later when I was in um, Asia and I got a call from one of my friends who was in Hong Kong, he says, Gary, do you want to you want to teach English here? And I, I didn't hesitate one second. I said, sure. Um, so I was hired by a UN-based organization called Social Services. And they were providing um, education and managing experience to the refugees in Hong Kong. At that time, Hong Kong was the host to thousands of uh, refugees. And they were in Hong Kong more as Economic, they, they had to d determine whether they were economic migrants or true political refugees. And, and as I found out, that was very difficult to do. So 
thousands of Vietnamese men, women, and children were in penal colonies all throughout Hong Kong, on the mainland of Hong Kong, Hong Kong Island, and some of the surrounding islands. So um, I was assigned to a um, school out in the outskirts of um, Hong Kong in a, in a small town called Yuanlong. And it was located in an in a idyllic setting. It was in a jungle, papaya plants, and mango groves, banana trees. And there was an abandoned school there that um, the Hong Kong government gave to social services to provide education to the children. And so I was teaching English, health, and history to these young kids who were probably between 10 and 13 years old. And the idea was I was going to prepare them for re re um, relocation either to um, Australia, um, perhaps England, United States. Um, and so these kids were in limbo for many years, and it was a, a extremely disturbing and beautiful experience because I, number one, I got to know these young kids who were just so full of life and just wanted to learn, but they were so mischievous. Um, that was the first time I ever had children throw chalk at my head, or um, while I was writing on the board, they would jump out the window and go into the um, mango groves and steal mangoes, and the owners would come to the school and complain, and, and they would come into, the owners would come in the classroom and accuse my students. I would defend them, and then my students would stand up, and they have big red mango stains on their white shirts. Um, but at the same time, these kids, after I was, I was teaching them, um, they went home to basically were penal colonies, where there were old prison camps that were set up with bunk beds. And so families were living in these barracks with uh, blankets separating families for privacy. Um, these kids were growing up in Hong Kong, and they were losing their first language of Vietnamese and they were adopting um, Cantonese as their working language since that was the language of the country they were living in. And it was a desperate situation because um, not only because many of these, uh, my students and their parents were unclear what their future was going to be because it all depended on the interview. The interview was a time when they would be asked by UN officials, Hong Kong officials, about their, um, their need to be a, a refugee. Yeah, they would have to apply. They'd, they needed to prove they were persecuted in Vietnam for being, for example, an ally of the U.S. Army there, or a, they were part of the South Vietnamese Army during the war. And so a lot of the people fled Vietnam without evidence of this collusion with the American government. So many families were stuck for many years trying to prove their case. Um, I specifically remember an occasion I was in a island off of Hong Kong called Tai Chau. Tai Chau was a beautiful island out, in, out probably about 10 miles off the coast of Hong Kong. It was originally uh, supposed to be a, a Club Med island, but I, that Club Med deal fell through and it became a penal colony. And uh, a, a large group of uh, Vietnamese refugees were housed there. And I um, went to Tai Chau several times to do teacher training because some of the Vietnamese teachers there, you know, wanted to get more education how to teach English. And so I had an opportunity to um, spend weekends there and talk with people. And, and um, one of the mo most unusual things that happened, I remember playing basketball with a, a bunch of young men. And they were all barefoot, but we were playing full court press, you know, full court um, basketball and they're running around 90 degree heat barefoot and we're they were listening to cha-cha-cha music on the side and and I remember going over to listen to look at their tape deck and it was uh, a tape deck um, that was playing some cassette and I looked at the cassette and, and the music was made in Santa Ana and Santa Ana was a city I used to be living in and, and I didn't realize that there was a huge Vietnamese community there and while I was playing with these guys um, several of them came up to me and they said, um, take a look. And they shoved a piece of toilet paper wrapped object in my hand. And I opened it up and it was some white little object was there. And, and they said, Bones, prisoner, I, I know where I can find more. Get me an interview. And so basically I was um, subjected to what was, I think, a common thing for a lot of UN workers there. 
that um, people were claiming that they knew where um, MIAs, POWs, um, forgotten soldiers were buried. And at that time, it was a very hot political issue that um, some prison, if some people could get um, refugee status, if they could show that they had information that would lead to the discovery of POWs or MIAs. And again, you know, n knowing very little about the Vietnam War um, uh, caused me to go back to history books and read books like Fire in the Lake and learn more about our involvement in Vietnam. So um, after several years of working with the Vietnamese there, um, it really left a very strong impression, not only about the Vietnamese and their resiliency, but about, I think, immigrants in general. So as a teacher now, I teach mostly immigrants. And I, I don't see them as just um, people who should be glad that they're in this country of democracy and freedom. But I think of what have they gone through that no one will know or no one could give a damn about. And I think of, uh, of my students and the difficulties that they've had. And it's, um, it really makes my teaching um, more focused and also makes me more appreciative of having the opportunity to, to teach immigrants, especially the Vietnamese.